going to go live. Yeah, you should watch that. I was watching that. Yeah, I asked you. All right, before we get started, how much do I want to rate uh, the book Fab Four, Frequently Asked Questions, Everything Left to Know About the Beatles, and more? What should I give it? Four or five? Four. Four. Four point five. Five. Ooh. I like it. <laughs> Why? Good book. <laughs> there, submit it. <laughs> All right. Huh? No, I yeah, decided not to do it. It wasn't comfortable. YouTube was cycling, so I said, nah, I'm just going to record it. So, what happened was three states sent two sets of electors. What amendment kind of said that people are. Um, both, the vote could not be taken away, but left big loopholes. 15th is a vote. 14th guaranteed everybody what? Citizenship. Yeah, citizenship and yeah, civil rights under the Bill of Rights of the States. Who is kind of ignored in the old 14th Amendment? Just only half the population. <laughs> and with this, eventually, do we get to the commission at all? I think that's why the bell rang, wasn't it? So a commission was created to pit the president, basically a compromise between the Republican-controlled House and the Democratic-controlled Senate. Did I get that right? Reverse that. Democratic-controlled House, Republican-controlled Senate. But basically what you need to know is this, a commission was created. And it was going to have 15 members. And ideally it was going to be seven Republicans, seven Democrats, and then a neutral member of the Supreme Court. Yet Indiana appointed him to be the next senator, and so they appointed another person who just happened to be a Republican. So now it's eight Republicans, seven Democrats, on a commission to decide which one of the, in reality, seven sets of electors that were sent from these three states. Florida sent three. Anybody want to guess what happened? Let's see. The vote was 8-7 for all three states. Isn't that weird? And who got all of them? Hayes at 166, told it's 184. You need 185 to become president. All 19 went to Hayes by that commission. And that is why Hayes will win. Hayes will, be, will win the tightest electoral majority or electoral victory in history. Now remember, Tilda won the popular vote, but the popular vote does not matter. In a nice little electoral system created to get Washington elected and also to protect slave states. We still have it today, yeah. So the women could have voted and changed the Don't know. Yeah. Don't know which party you know people would have voted for. So it, it might. In 1920, once women started voting, especially the first about 20 years, an overwhelming majority of women voted the same way as now. So the couples voted the same. And and so, single women. And the same thing here, if there would have been more blacks up that could have had access to the vote here, but troops weren't there to protect them, maybe another one of those states would have worked too. And so with that, Democrats said, all right, nothing will ever get done through government. Back then, both the House and the Senate, now only the Senate, could do something, and I mentioned this once before, called the filibuster. Remember I talked about this when we got to the Senate. It's named after those soldiers of fortune from the 1850s. And what it meant is you could basically debate and delay a bill in Congress so nothing gets done. Debate it to death. Now only the Senate does. And the Democrats said, we will do this for every single bill. Now, it was almost never done. I mean, this was seen as unconstitutional. In fact, it was seen as anti-Republican form of government. You know, that's not what Republican government does. I'll destroy the Republic if you have filibusters all the time. Ironically, today, every single bill is filibustered. Every single one. Now, you're living in an amazing time. The Republic appears to be kind of tumbling. We'll see where it goes. When all you get rid of the norms of how Republicans function and say, nope, we're just going to kind of alter that. Now, every bill is filibustered in the Senate. Yeah. So, what does that mean? It's just not. You can debate a bill to death in a filibuster. There can be no voting on a bill until debate is done. The House had it too, but now House rules said no. This is not in the Constitution. This is a Senate rule. 
And today, the only back then, you had to get all senators to stop the debate, but they almost never did. Today, it required 60 votes to stop the debate. And so that means that every single bill now requires 60 votes, a super majority to pass. So today, nothing gets done. So all you need is one party to obstruct and nothing gets done. And so, with that, and then it was uh, Democrats who were going to do it. Then, that was Democrats who said they'd build up. Today, it's Republicans who could do it. Who knows what tomorrow may bring. And so, with that, we have the Compromise of 1877. That was well done because, no, not well done, Hayes will be president. Is something happening back there? <laughs> We're watching a very good movie in special topics, and now I have to try to shut this, so I can't see the score. <laughs> so the big crow might come to the window any moment and take someone away, and I won't be able to stop him. <laughs> so, Hayes is president. With that, the Republicans agreed to end Reconstruction. Over the next six months, all the remaining troops were pulled out. And so once you have this, Oh, and then there'll be a Southern Postmaster. That was a big deal. Whoever controls the mail, that's a pretty plumb cabinet post. It's no longer a cabinet post, but back then it was. And not only you know the importance of the mail, but a lot of graft. Graft is literally stealing from the government. And the thing about this was, once the federal government said, we're pulling the troops out, and we're no longer going to, the federal government's no longer going to interfere in the South, that's it. Every state of the old Confederacy, one by one, then will completely take away the rights of freedmen. Every single one. And states that even stayed in the Union, like Kentucky, is going to take them away. Because basically, it's like, okay, we can do what we want. And so, even though states' troops were only in three states, that was still symbolic. You know, the federal government still cares about equal rights. Now, they no longer care. Yeah. Uh, what would the Confederacy take away? All the rights for freedmen. All the rights for freedmen. But not just then, we'll get to it more a little bit later. But this is the end of Reconstruction. And what we're going to have now is a new South going to be created. And one thing we got to get about the new South, it is going to be very insular. I didn't put that, this on the slide. Do you know what insular means? It's one of these words, it's a great word. Insular means like an island. Isolated, that's a U. Insular. It's very insular. So the South is going to become really isolated for the next 70 years. There will be a little bit of industry because uh, because of the laws that they keep um, workers, white and black, the wages are really low. And so some industry will come in there, but for the most part, it's going to be isolated. It's going to feel like a different part of the world. And yeah, if you go to Alabama today, it feels different than Montana for obvious reasons, but not like it was then. It really felt like a 1900 is a different world. And so a lot of it comes out of this. They were going to left alone. So basically, northern politicians, especially Republicans, were saying, we're letting you alone, pass our tariffs. We want a tariff. That's what really happened there. And there will be a lot of people forgotten. But economically, the divide was already happening before Reconstruction ended because slaves got nothing economically after, former slaves got nothing after the Civil War. The system of sharecropping and tenant farming was already developing. You read about this, but let me give you a few more details about this. Because we already have the economic isolation of a significant amount of population, not just blacks, but more whites too. Think about the big plantation owners. After the war, they have land if they survive, but there's no money, they're completely broke, they're in debt, they have nothing, and no one to work the land. But former slaves have nothing. Now, a lot of former slaves, as soon as they were free, they went, the first thing they did is to look for their family members who had been sold. Kind of a sad end of slavery that no one really thinks about. You know, slavery, they just sell, they sell family members all the time. But then, they have nothing, nothing, nothing at all, except for hands. Later. That's all they got. So here we have plantation owners that they survived with land, ex-slaves, and then, you know, it's going to be rigged to the people on the land, but still, what's going to start first are going to be tenant farmers. And tenant farmers, as old as there has been land, 
owned by people with, who have forests to control it. They rent the land out. And tenant means they live on the land. So they build a little shack on the land. It might be the very same plantation that they were slaves on. Poor whites did it too. And they would pay, they'd sell the crop, have to sell, grow a crash crop like cotton, sell it, get paid, pay their rent. But here's the deal. You borrow loan, or I'm sorry, you borrow money. If you do that, you know what I mean when I say collateral. You gotta put something down. So let's say you go out and buy a boat. You ever think about buying a boat? You think, okay, and I'll put my house down as collateral. By the way, a lot of people do that. I'm not kidding. You just want to say, don't, don't, don't do that. You're not going to live in your 14 foot boat. That's why I bought a 100 foot yacht. <laughs> <laughs> but you put your house down, well, that's your collateral. What it means is the bank has a document that you sign that says if you don't pay back your loan, they get your house. That document is called a lien. It literally means they put a lien on your house. In this context, they put a lien on your crop or a crop lien. If you can't pay back the rent, you have money, they get your crop. Well, if you, they get your crop, how are you ever going to pay the debt back next year? You see the problem? And not only that, where is a, is a tenant farmer going to get money for things to build their home? So you know they're going to be little shacks. Food, clothing, any other necessity you might need to get through the air, they have to borrow. And they would borrow from the landlords, thus increasing the amount of debt. And all it would take, especially in the South, where the economy was so bad, and the whole entire nation's economy was bad out of the war. A few bad years, and boom, you're in debt. A cycle of debt that you can't get out. Tenant farming is really difficult. In fact, they barely make it. Farming is you really, the market really gets you. No matter how hard you work, you're still reliant upon the prices you get for your crop. Well, that's where you get the share crop. Because that, the crop lien system, as they called it, or tenant farming, would turn into, okay, we're not going to take money. We just want 80, 90, 100% of your crop. Then you can live that. How are you ever going to get out of that? And they go, oh, you're on your farm. You can grow food. Well, you can't grow food because 100% of your crop, and it would be 100%, would go to the landlord, and they don't want vegetables. They want cotton. And so you're even more debt. Thus, a cycle of debt that would pass on to your children, that your children's children, and so on and so on and so on. Now, that is a terrifying system right there. But why sharecropping would be so dangerous is once you have redeemer governments, remember the term redeemer? Once you have those, they begin to pass a series of laws to rig the system. And these are what you got to get with the laws. Very quickly, laws would be passed to say, you can't leave the land, so the land where you owe money, until you pay back your debt. And the debt's passed on to your children. So if you can't leave the land, pay back a debt that you'll never pay back, what are you now? Slavery. Yeah, but not quite, because you, under slavery, the master, okay, at least had to go through the illusion of caring for the life of their slaves. Now, hey, you're just a renter. No, I don't care what happens to you as long as you get your share of food. So it's almost like that quota system that went through slavery, just in a totally different way now, using debt as a way to hold people down. And these are laws. Laws are passed by politicians. This is political. Has everyone got that? Yeah, it started out with this economic issue, but then the system was made political. Things don't happen in a vacuum. The sun didn't come up and all of a sudden we have sharecroppers stuck to the land. They were stuck because they rigged the system politically. They made laws. The vote really matters. And if you don't do it or can't do it, oh yeah, maybe somebody will be elected that cares for you, but anybody want to bet on that? How often does that happen? I can think of a couple. There's a few good ones out there, right? There's a lot of good ones. But most of them care about themselves. Let's be true. I mean, it's just the way life is. And so this economic thing will be a political structure, too. And now they're stuck in this. Why is this important? Well, first off, let me show you this. This is by 1910. Look at the percentage of all the different colors from 
Light, very few farms, but darker the color. I shouldn't lie up. I know. My projector is not very good. The red color is up to 90% of the people, farmers that are sharecroppers. This is not just poor blacks. These are poor whites. Or in this matter, in Texas, a significant number of Hispanics. You remember that used to be part of Mexico. And so this is a big deal. What an amazing way if you're that tiny little group on top. Now, this does drive wage, this drives wages down. It keeps the economic growth slow in these areas. But at the same time, those on top stay on top. So yeah, might not, not be the best for everybody, but it's good for them. If this happened, this is just the South, the former states of the Confederacy. There are sharecroppers and tent farmers all over, of course, in Montana too. My great grandfather had a grandfather, Adi, had a little sharecroppers farm. Actually, started his farm, lost it to the bank, became tent farmers and then sharecroppers near Weeping Water, Nebraska. Yes, the town's name was Weeping Water, Nebraska. And my dad was born on that sharecropper's farm. So when I say, I was born on a sharecropper's well, my dad actually was born on a sharecropper's farm. And they lost the farm right at the beginning of World War II. They lost it. And the farmhouse is still there, this ranchackle little thing now in a little clump of trees near the, near the Platte River. But it's also reality for a lot of people. And that sharecropper, but think about this. Okay, so now we have this economic system ingrained in law, codified, so to speak, and the laws now are being written in these Confederates, former states of the Confederacy, and outside of it, places like Kentucky or Kansas, to create a system that we would eventually call, by the turn of the last century, Jim Crow laws. And you know what these are? Jim Crow laws were the laws. Think about the Black Codes. Well, these are like the next extension of the Black Codes. You know, the Black Codes are right after the Civil War, and they basically ingrained slavery. Can't do that now because of the 14th Amendment. So it's kind of rewritten to say, we're not taking away people's rights, but we're setting up a system that takes away people's rights. And the most basic definition of Jim Crow, which you got to get down, is this. It's, it was legal segregation of the South. Legal segregation. So it allowed for public segregation of facilities like public schools or public buildings, but also set up the system to make it very easy for private segregation. So there would be whites-only restaurants. And yeah, there'd be black-only ones too, but that was more just because whites wouldn't go there. White-only hotels. Or separate facilities. I thought this was a good picture. This is actually from uh, the teens. And this is a movie theater, a brand one of the new movie theaters, but the colored mission up top for 10 cents. The whites can sit better seats in the bottom. And it would eventually go to all levels of government, including the US federal government. This is World War II. This is a base in the South. This is actually North Carolina, and we have white officers and colored officers for the U.S. Army in World War II. Ironic, fighting against ultimate racism in the Nazis. Huh. Not really a kind of a, a moral crisis there. Yeah, that would actually be a big issue after the war to motivate the civil rights movement. I and mean, what the hell are we fighting for? And this is Jim Crow. This is from a minstrel show. That was a minstrel show with a name guy. This actually, no one's really sure how these segregation laws became named this. Okay, so you hear that, and that sounds horrible. It's quite a shock if somebody from the North goes South, white or black, especially for someone who grew up in, still pretty tough in a big town like Chicago, but a black person going South would be a out of the world shock. We'll get to that. Chicago down South, rough World War II. And think about it, you know, so it's bad that. It's, it's horrific. I, I'm not going to defend it at all. I'm, I'm showing my bias here. I don't like this. But to not allow a huge percent of the population to eat at restaurants or go to the same hotel or whatever, okay, that's horrific. But it's bigger than this. It's a lot bigger than this. And this is why it's bigger. By saying you can have only white-owned businesses and facilities that only do commerce with whites, haven't you just totally iced out said that blacks cannot participate in the same commercial ventures that whites can. And for that matter, be very similar for Hispanics in, in the South, in places like Texas, too. Think about it. You're basically saying they cannot operate this business. They cannot carry on commercial activity. You're dramatically limiting their ability to enter the commercial world, to make money, to whatever your measure of success is. You have limited greatly. 
That means basically what you're saying is a huge percent of the population, there's only a few things you can do. There's only a few things you can do. By the way, that will have a net effect of lowering all wages, but that's huge. And that's a big deal. And you can make the argument, if people do, that will weigh, well, if someone has a business, they can decide who they trade with. Yeah, you know, they can make that decision, but there's a catch to it. Everybody uses United States dollars. You use dollars, then you you got to trade with everybody. And that's what eventually the federal government will decide in 1964. We are the ones who issue the money. And if you want business and use money, you got to let everybody come here. That's how come that happens. I guess it's fine if you don't want to serve everybody, but they don't use dollars or, or have the police come to get robbed. Deal with it yourself. And so, that is a big deal. I can't emphasize that enough. Remember I talked about economies of scale? I would just put another layer in there to make it worse. Another thumb on the scale against a huge group of them. Think about it, you already have women who aren't counted as citizens. That's a thumb on the scale against them for years. And then we have the same thing against blacks. Now, this doesn't help most whites either. This keeps their wages low too. This keeps wages low for, for whites, most whites too. So I'm not saying, oh, I'm poor, white, white, got it easy. No, no. It's actually, it kind of taps down demand and hurts the economy in the long run. But it keeps those on top of the top. It's called secular stagnation, and that's the entire world's economy today. <laughs> We're kind of going through what it was like in the South, tamping down on demand, keeping everybody's wages low. This is where I'm going to say that, yeah, it's because you guys don't work hard enough, as hard as my generation. We were tough. We worked hard. Now, that's what adults who say that say what first time every adult says that about them. When they get old, they look down, you didn't work as hard as I did. Because yeah. <laughs> they said it about me too. I did. I worked harder. But secondly, we're all victims of whatever the economic system is, no matter how hard you work. So that's Jim Crow. But the thing is, these are laws. And why they're important is the denial of the vote. It's not Jim Crow, but it ties in. It's going to be dubbed the Mississippi Plan, and it was designed to keep blacks from voting. Blacks are voting Republican? Don't let blacks vote. Now, the most basic way would be just intimidation, terror, suppress voting, make it really hard for blacks to vote, or literally threaten them with death. Beat the hell out of them if they vote. Burn down their homes. Beat up their children. I'm not kidding about that. That's a little bit hackney, but yeah, it's not far from the truth of a black man trying to vote. But the most important thing is the loophole of the 15th Amendment. Laws. Now remember, laws are decided by elected officials. And boy, an elected official can rig who votes. Wow, don't they have power? And this is it. The grandfather's clause. This would be the big one. Part of the Mississippi plan was to keep blacks from voting, use whatever method, but the best method of keeping them from voting would be, you might have heard this term, grandfathered, or being a grandfathered, have you ever heard that? What it meant is, in this context, if your grandfather did not vote, you have to take a literacy test. Everybody, the rule applies to everybody, so I'm not saying certain people can't vote. Everybody has the same right to vote, and if your grandfather did not vote, you have to take a literacy test. Now, the literacy test is a test on your knowledge of government. Your knowledge of government. Who do you suppose could pass this test? Huh? Not even whites. Nobody. Because their grandfathers could vote. They don't have to pass it. Whose grandfathers couldn't vote? Slaves, the descendants of slaves, or new immigrants? One of the reasons new immigrants are not going to the South. Have you just effectively kept an entire group out of voting? And the story was the people who gave the test never could have passed the test. But they didn't have to. And the test is impossible. I have the 1955 Alabama one. That actually was kind of a cool find, but now it's a lot easier because of, because of all the internet tubes. 
So you can look these up. But I have the 55 one. I gave it to well, Mr. Cooney has it. He gives it to his AP government after the AP exam, and nobody has it. Nobody. I guarantee none of you would. My guess is a few of you would might get 15, 10%. And that would be very much the norm. Now, I kind of know this stuff, and and I took it, and I got like an 81 or something, and I thought, I knew this. I'm looking at, I don't know some of this stuff. Like, list all 70 cabinet member, cabinet level positions. I, I can't. I, mean, I know what they are, but I have to kind of, you know, you forget names. Yeah, there's 17. Yeah, you have to know every little detail about government. It was designed so no one could pass. With the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that would be made illegal. Did you catch the date? 1965. One more thing we must add. They also had a poll tax. Poll taxes were not unusual. You'd have to pay a tax in January to vote in November. Now, the tax is not very high. The sharecroppers have no money. Poll taxes effectively kept poor people from voting. Mostly, or most uh, blacks could not vote then because of the grandfather's clause in the poll tax, but a significant number of poor whites couldn't vote either because of that. Poll taxes would be made unconstitutional in 1963, even though there are loopholes to it. Yeah. So if they kept this for like generations, wouldn't it just make it permanent that they couldn't vote? Because if their grandfather didn't pass the test, they wouldn't pass the test, so it just made it permanent. So pretty much by by the time you get to World War One, yeah, blacks can't vote. In fact, that's one of the big deals when blacks started trying to escape, literally escape the law and go north. They take jobs like in Detroit. They could only go to big cities, not so wide and set. But when they started going north, it was such a big deal because it was segregated, there were issues there, but they vote. And so that became the norm. It wasn't that long before we had the Civil War and all this was fought. And so what we're going to have is this new South being created. And you have those laws that kept people on sharecropping farms are part of Jim Crow. It's all being ingrained. So with this, we have a solid South developing. As a solid South meant, it all, there's only one political party, and it's the Democratic Party. Why is it the Democratic Party? Lincoln was a Republican. Now, ideologically, for their beliefs, the Southern Democratic Party had a lot of disagreements with Northern Democrats who were significantly more open to civil rights. And I put this picture in here because it only voted for Democrats, period. Here's John Kennedy, a Northern Democrat who was for expanding equal rights, yet he had to go to the South and campaign, and there he is in Georgia. Yep, they put that uh, Confederate battle flag there in the 1950s because we're anti-civil rights, but he had to go there then. The, this would it would break down over civil rights when the Republican Party would come out against civil rights in '64 would be the first time since Reconstruction that these states voted for the Republicans and then over the next 30 years the switch would begin to happen in the 1990s literally by the end of the decade just had made the full reverse and now the South is solid Republican there are some Democrats but the Democrats are really badly organized. And the Democrats made horrific mistakes in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, through now. And, but it does help. They think about it. If you always know, you're going to get a vast majority of Congress and electoral votes from one big area of the country. It really changes how you do things. So with that, one important court case, Plessy versus Ferguson would codify make constitutional Jim Crow laws by saying separate but equal facilities were constitutional. Now, what is equal? States decided what is equal. So as long as you say, I have a school for black children, you are equal. You know, the school has no key. The average classroom has a size of 60, like it did in Louisiana or black school with no textbooks. And don't worry about heat, that's just crazy luxuries. Qualified teachers, crazy talk. I'm waiting for the comment. Good. All right, no one made it. Good for you. I figured one of you would badmouth me about qualified teachers. You didn't do it, did you? <laughs> so what were you thinking, Ed? Didn't that happen? Yeah? 
it must be easier to be qualified. Okay, so actually what happened was on the Southern Pacific Railroad, they didn't want to pay for two rail cars, so they actually funded the case for Homer Plessy right here to sit in a white car. But 7-2 to two ruling, not until 1964, this would be in Granite still, it has not been fully overturned. Only pieces of it, like for example, 1954, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, would be only for public schools. And even then, it was unclear. They had to do two more Brown decisions. And so the vestiges of this, the tentacles, still remain. Separate but equal, and equal is open for interpretation. And so a couple things then. Once you have this, you have this growing then attitude of, the South was actually fighting this noble, in fact, they literally called the Lost Cause. This is from 1890s, the, the flag of the Confederacy, the emblem of the Lost Cause. This idea that the South was fighting a noble fight for rights, and that is where you get starting up in the 1880s, 1890s, and actually the peak of its usage would be the 1940s, calling the Civil War the war between the states. Nobody called it the war between the states until after Reconstruction. But saying the war between the states implies that this was a fight between equal states. And you're fighting for the rights of states. And you've taken away this idea that no, the South were willing to destroy the Union to protect slavery, which is what everybody said during the war. And so the Confederate battle flag would come to represent that lost cause up until the 1950s. Here is a human Confederate flag. It says this, you get this postcard, and they painted it in. That's where you get this weird kind of draft. But they made that in front of Link, the statue memorializing Lee in Virginia. Isn't the statue there? It's kind of a cool statue. I like statues. I like statues of men on horses. Yes? Well, what's the battle flag represent? Of the Lost Cause. The battle flag come to represent the Lost Cause. And with this, then it's going to come out this Lost Cause. So the South was fighting a noble cause, and then the North came in destroyed them, this northern aggression, and leads to, we're getting right to this, a reconstruction myth. That reconstruction was just an invasion of the South to destroy the South and their gallant way of life. And that is where we get this idea then that, that uh, or the people, I'm sorry, would forget that it was a fight for rights and to bring these people who betrayed their country back in. No, the North was destroying them. And this would be personified by a book that would be turned into a movie that's considered to be one of the greatest movies ever made, a silent movie from 1913, D.W. Griffin's classic, The Birth of a Nation. So think about 1913, 50 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And, you see the original title of it? The hero of The Birth of a Nation is the Ku Klux Klan, who drove out those evil Reconstruction governments and those former slaves who were brutal, horrible savages and replaced it with noble white rule. And so here we have a white man in blackface, because that's the way they portray blacks, about to be stopped because he was one of the carpetbag governments. And here is another one being stopped by the glorious Klan. The only thing I will say is every time I look at this, since I will admit, I'm showing my bias here, I don't like the Klan. But, you notice how they put the clan? Does it look like they're wearing white plungers on their head? <laughs> and to me, that discredits them immediately. Someone also said racist candles, and I thought it was a pretty good idea, too. <laughs> President Woodrow Wilson, who was elected in 1912, a Democrat, the first Southerner elected since before the Civil War, he was the president of Princeton College, and actually his professor. I've actually never read a book. That's a story for another time. But Wilson, his comment would be put on one of the screens in the movie. And if you can't read it, it says, his description, this is the president of the United States. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation. Talking about Reconstruction. Until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. The Klan are heroes. It's no coincidence that the Klan will make a comeback in just a few years later, after this movie, because they're heroes. 
the most racist president in American history will be 50 years after the Civil War, not before. The most racist time in history will be after the Civil War, when it will be this desperate desire to control the rights of freedmen, or for that matter, for people out of the South to keep them from coming into your neighborhood. And it's a good movie. I'm not kidding. It's a good, very disturbing movie. But it's brilliant. You watch it and say, it's like, that's 1913? In special topics a couple years ago, we watched that. And it was good, but it's it's disturbing. Silent movies are kind of hard. You have to get your mind geared up to watch a silent movie. Now, where is the reconstruction the culmination? Gone with the Wind. Who's seen Gone with the Wind? Yeah, we've mentioned this once before, right? So what would we say? 72 hours. The first 40, not bad, right? No, what is it? Just under four hours. It's a good book. I've read the book. You have? It's a very good book, but it's nothing at all reality. But people believe that's the way the South was. This gallant, and this is the screen when the first movie starts. And there's a little rolling, scrolling down, 1938. In fact, this won the Academy Award and not Wizard of Oz. I know the 50th anniversary. Do you? And the one they, they, re, they remastered, it is, it's really good. Well, the gallantry of the South, and who, and where the slaves are, they portray them as like loving slavery. They love it. And who came and destroyed that? That's a Northern soldier. Ugh, the villain. The gallant and noble South. Yeah, the Reconstruction myth is going to become reality. That's what the South wants you to believe it was. And the North is kind of like, yeah, I guess you're right. I like it. It's a good movie. I would never show up in class. I know some teachers have, but it would literally be a semester, I think. I think we pretty much, let's just sit down for the semester and watch Gone with the Wind. And so I'd be like, yes, please. Well, in this, then, this new South will be, it's called the nadir or the height of racism in the United States. The most racist time in our history will go from the end of Reconstruction through the 1950s. Nader means the height, the epitome, the best example of racism. So this is in the South, and look at the, everyone coming out to get their picture posed with a lynching. People were being lynched about once a day by 1900. Here is, we don't know what happened to him. When he, he was burned, this is a burned body being hung. We don't know when it happened, you know, what the timeline was, what killed him. You know, lynching is just torturing to death. But look at everyone happy, posing with the picture. Um, my mom, who grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, remembers somebody about half a mile away from where she grew up. A black man was lynched and then they beat him to death and hung him from a uh, a light pole, not far from where she lived. And so it's out of it's in other places too. And yeah, the most racist time. And something about this. Not only we have this, but we got to jump the gun here to sundown towns, all over areas outside of the south. Small and medium-sized towns begin to grow up called sundown towns. Just catch what I said. These are not in the south. These are towns outside of the south that want to keep it was blacks, but also Hispanics out. And also, uh, and we get further west, Chinese or Japanese immigrants. But these became a very common thing. There were over 30,000 of these towns in the United States. They were across the railroads in Montana, the Milwaukee, the Northern Pacific and the Great North, there were some downtowns here too. And this is from a town in Illinois. This is Decatur, Indiana. This is Illinois too. Just keep out of town. My dad grew up in a little tiny town after they got kicked off the farm. A town called Louisville, Nebraska. Should be Louisville, but in Nebraska, it's Louisville. A town of a thousand people. And the town where he grew up in, there was a sign that said, No neighbors after dark. As a little kid, 30s and 40s, that's what he grew up in. In 1943, workers, mostly Mexican immigrants and also African Americans, working on the, the Rock Island Railroad. We're doing part during World War II. And a couple workers came into town, and kind of a mob of Louis Villians grabbed one of them and lynched them outside of town. Sawed them off in half on a barbed wire fence. That was 1943. <laughs> Oh, and then my uh, my grandpa, Grandpa Partridge, the Klan burned a cross on his yard in 1944. 
He chased him off with a shotgun. <laughs> they thought he was a Jew or a Mormon and was hiding his roots. So, I didn't quite get to the West, but we'll do it tomorrow. The quiz, I'm looking at about 20 questions. I got 100% on it, even though I'm not even done. That's how well prepared I am for this. It's crazy. Anybody else? Yes. As soon as somebody gets their test done. Oh, you, what? Yeah, it was wrong. If you, can someone get the lights? Oh, no, wait, we got a limbo. Don't run, I saw that. Can somebody get one of the 